today meeting is was a request made by the committee to uh, the SPD to make a presentation on on the past, present, and future of Skyline Apartment. Uh, that presentation will take place first. Second, if there are community members or individuals that want to make comments or community organization that want to make comments, they would be uh, granted or will be granted two minutes each to make their case. And then, um, as well as counselor uh, along the way will, would, would ask questions as, as the SPD uh, uh, per, uh, department present. So that, that will be that. Uh, that being said, I'm joined by my colleagues. Uh, Councilor Driscoll is here. Councilor Green is here. Councilor Hogan. And uh, am I missing other counselors here? Councilor Carney. Councilor Carney, thank you very much. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, Chief Buckner, Deputy Mayor Owens, and uh, our co counsel, Kristen Smith, PJ Shaw, uh, City Clark, and Greg Law. I see so many of uh, folks here. Um, so, but I don't want to mention everyone because that's, that will take forever. So, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Collins as well, I see uh, Councilor White, thank you for joining us. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, Deputy Mayor Owen and Chief Buckner, take it away. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, we're here again uh, at the request of the Council to present um, to you activities that we have engaged in over several years at the Skyline Apartments. Uh, 753 James Street. You mentioned everyone, so I don't need to go through everyone is here where we're represented by five or six uh, city departments and each of them I've asked them to take about no more than five minutes to kind of go through what um, they have been engaged in. I, I submitted to uh, council members um, a timeline uh, put together um, engaging in the activities that each department was involved in over the course of a couple years. And uh, they'll be giving you an overview of what was submitted in that document. So I'll start with um, the Syracuse Police Department. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Owens. Uh, yes, could we have everyone mute themselves, please? Okay, uh, thank you for having us on here. Is it still doing it? Jim, could you see if uh, everyone is muted? It's just, uh, I think it's his connection or possibly if there's someone, if your phone's open, someone else is nearby, is your phone open? Try again, Chief. Okay, Councilman Majoke. Yeah, sounds clear now. Okay, all right. So, thank you for having us on here. Uh, I, I will just uh, reinforce what the Deputy Mayor said before. I know that uh, much of this has been, uh, it appears at least publicly, uh, in the lap of police because obviously we had a horrific incident happen from the, from the standpoint of a, a crime that occurred. Miss uh, Tory was killed. Uh, but the, the city has had a collective effort uh, on this. Uh, I believe we, the city started in 2018. Police department officially put it uh, in our kind of targeted approach in 2019. Uh, so, but we've had several partners that have assisted us uh, with that. Uh, Chief Trudell is going to kind of give you an overview of what we have done, what we're doing, uh, and what we see kind of the path going forward. Uh, I will give you all of a, of, of a little bit of a warning. We had a press conference earlier today and, and I'm still having issues. I had an eye exam this morning, so I still can't see or read anything right now, but I can see a little blurry faces, but uh, so don't ask me to read something to you, Councilman Majo, because I would not be able to do so. Uh, so Chief Trudell, if you can give him an overview, please. Thanks, Jake. Okay. So um, when I took over in August of 2019, um, 
the, the Skyline Apartments in particular, the 700 block of James Street was high on our list already. Um, kind of the driving force behind that was the mayor's quality of life blocks. There was 20 of them and the 700 block of James Street was one of those. And when you did a, a call drill down on that particular block, the 753 Skyline was the driving force behind all those blocks. So from, from August 4th, um, again, I'm getting a lot of feedback, so he's not muted. Chief Buff, oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, it really was a, a joint approach between Chief, 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 Chief Trudeau, give me a second. Uh, Larry Fuller, thank you. All right, can you hear me now better? Yeah, everyone, please just keep yourself on mute. We keep doing it. There's 71 people on right now, and it's hard to keep up with everyone forgetting to do so. So just make sure you're muted. Thank you. See a lot of shaking heads, so I think it's better now. All right, so between August and November of 2019, Captain Fournier and Lieutenant Holtman um, met with the Skyline Tenant Association multiple times. Um, we spoke with Sharon Sherman, trying to get a sense of what was going on at the Skyline. Um, and it, during that process, we actually received several complaints from those folks on our efforts to improve things there. Um, we assigned all three of our watches to conduct property checks at that location, parking lots, um, and in and around that um, uh, property. On the 21st and 22nd um, of August, we conducted joint um, site visits um, with Syracuse Codes, Fire, MBD, Law, and SFD. Um, Fast forward to December 6th, which is another high point. Um, we met at City Hall with uh, the management from the Skyline uh, Apartments. Um, with us at the time was uh, MBD, law, fire, codes. In particular, um, the police department shared with Green National our top seven um, things that we were seeing from a security standpoint as to what um, they needed to do to uh, clean up their property. Um, and that is on that summary um, that the deputy mayor provided. But really, it's it, it, it all circled around having 24-7 security with um, lockdown access points, challenging visitors, making sure they had ID. Um, staff should be monitoring those doors at all times. Coordinating with Helio Health um, on their problem tenants, which is occurring now. Um, and then finally, uh, securing trespass affidavits from folks that weren't supposed to be on the property so that the next time they were on the property they could be addressed um, through an arrest. Um, we provided all that to, uh, to to the management on the 6th of December. Um, we provided some additional data to Skyline management regarding yearly call volumes to give them a sense of what was going on on the 10th. When you look at the stats, all of our efforts from August through this meeting uh, in December, the end of December, really drove the calls down from September um, through January, and those low calls stayed with us pretty much through May of 2020, uh, according to the call data. Um, in July of 2020 through August of 2020, we received some uh, additional complaints about drug dealing um, and conduct at the, uh, the Skyline. Again, property checks were done. Um, we made arrests, our Intel detectives made drug arrests on uh, July 9th and July 20th of 2020. Um, in September of 2020, Mayor Walsh received some complaints about drugs. And again, Captain Fournier um, assigned property checks at that location. Moving forward to December of 2020, specifically the 23rd of December through uh, the 1st, uh, I'm sorry, the 19th of January, so from 20 into 21, we spent a significant amount of time at the Skyline almost daily. Um, it started off as a person in crisis call, um, kind of a barricaded situation. Um, that quickly turned into follow-ups almost daily at that location um, uh, regarding this person in crisis until we had that individual in custody. So we spent a lot of time um, in those four weeks at um, the Skyline. In late January, we received two complaints um, from constituent services forwarded from over at the mayor's office, one on the 25th and one on the 31st. Um, they were um, concerned with general health um, um, of the building in the common areas, um, in addition to um, people not being in the building when they're not supposed to be, um, drug use, that sort of thing. 
So on the 21st, I'm sorry, the 25th and the 31st of January. On the 1st of February, SPD requested to meet with uh, Jake Dishon Constituent Services. We did that on the 2nd of February, where we discussed a joint unannounced visit um, at the Skyline um, concerning all of our, our, our um, uh, complaints that we got, those two complaints. On the 5th of February, so three days later, um, that uh, site visit occurred. Um, and and um, I'm sure I'll, uh, everybody on this uh, call to include Codes Fire will be able to, to give you everything that they did on those. But we did that uh, on scheduled site uh, visit on the 5th. Um, on the 19th, we had a robbery investigation there where we can, uh, made an arrest. Um, the 24th, uh, again, we reached out for another site visit on the 24th of February. That site visit occurred on the 26th of February. Um, Captain Fournier sent uh, one of his sergeants to that location on the 25th to meet with management about uh, issues at that location. Uh, we did a call load analysis on the 25th. And then on the March uh, 21st, we reviewed all the nuisance, uh, uh, we re reviewed the property for nuisance abatement. Um, on the 19th of March, that's when we started our detail. Um, it was two days after uh, Ms. Tory was located um, in her apartment deceased. So two days after that, we have uh, a detail going out. It was four officers, six hours a day, seven days a week. And then uh, on the 22nd of March to the 24th of March, we uh, worked with law and the, the chief's office to sign uh, the nuisance notice, and that was posted on the property on the 24th. On the 31st, we again do a, a joint meeting with the mayor, deputy mayor, Captain Fournier, and the Tenants Association. And currently, our detail is still going on, and nuisance abatement is scheduled for May 10th, the hearing. As a quick uh, summary of our stats, I can put that up here. So far, 21 details, 11 arrests, um, to include 18 charges, eight misdemeanor, 10 violations, and two warrant arrests. Um, more importantly, or as equally important, um, we're doing a lot of visitor checks. We're challenging folks at the door, making sure they have ID. We've done ejections, and we've issued trespass notices. So since that detail started on the 19th, we've received a lot of com uh, compliments from the Tenants Association um, and the folks uh, that are living there stopping us when we're, uh, when we're in that building about that detail. And that uh, concludes my summary. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, that's, that's it for us. Okay. Uh, continue on, Councilman Majo. Is that is that it for all all, all departments, uh, Deputy Mayor? Oh. We have a lot coming up. Okay, go ahead then. That's me. All right. Um, I just have to bring up my my notes here. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, law has been involved. You know, our role typically is to work with the code enforcement department in bringing legal action when there's not. Uh, cooperation from the owner to come into compliance after being notified by the codes department. So this, you know, property is not a new one to that process. Um, there's been ongoing concerns with the elevators in that building, which is, you know, a, quite a big issue given the size of the building. And so um, back in 2018, we actually did file a petition in state Supreme Court uh, because they did not have, they were not in compliance in terms of their elevator um, inspections. And we ultimately uh, received an order and judgment from from the court uh, ordering them to come into compliance after there was um, after the, they actually didn't appear uh, in court to defend themselves and uh, received a judgment from from the court in the amount of four thousand six hundred dollars. Um, we ended up executing the rents from commercial tenants in order to collect that money. So we ended up getting a the city ended up collecting over five thousand dollars from the owners as a penalty essentially for not being in compliance with the elevators and they did eventually come into compliance but it took took much too long even back then it took um from from when we filed the petition it took almost a year and that's not counting the period of non-compliance prior to that but we you know we used the resources that we had in the legal system um at that point and um currently elevators are again an issue and we've 
we brought a petition again, you know, recently uh, seeking a motion an, an order to compel compliance and again penalties because clearly um, that penalty back in 2019 didn't send a strong enough message um, that the elevators need to always be in compliance. So we're pursuing that. Um, the other legal action that we were involved with um, with respect to code enforcement was a hot water issue. Um, we brought, because we didn't get compliance, we brought a petition in state Supreme Court again. Um, by the time the, the court heard it, the, the ownership had come into compliance and much to our dismay and disappointment, uh, the court didn't issue any penalties, but instead just dismissed the petition because there had been compliance, which is inconsistent with what we've been most recently arguing to the courts, which is when you have these uh, chronic um, and you know, flagrant violations of our codes, there needs to be some penalty so that we can drive you know, new incentives to be, to be compliant with our codes. Um, that's an ongoing struggle that I think many on this call are aware of, and we continue to advocate for a change in position from our court system uh, every time we can. Um, you know, we have the, the, the newish tool of the Bureau of Administrative Adjudication or the BAA. Leah Whitmer couldn't, uh, couldn't make it here uh, right at this moment today, so I wanted to report that we did have some code violation issues referred over to the BAA, particularly during the past year because courts weren't readily available to us during the, um, the pandemic. Uh, they were very much limited to extreme, you know, emergency matters and, you know, you know due to various rulings from the court, uh, it was virtually impossible for us to bring legal action on these types of things. And so uh, the BAA did issue multiple tickets um, against the um, uh, this particular property in March. Uh, they quickly pled guilty and paid the fine. The fine was um, the fines are not huge, though, uh, under that stat under that ordinance. Uh, and given the size of this property, you know, maybe wasn't quite the the, the penalty that we, we might want to see, but that they did pay the $600 penalty on that one. Uh, but then when that was not, um, uh, they did come into compliance on those, but uh, now now all of the matters, we're not going to be putting them through the BAA um, because of the size of those penalties. We'll be pursuing them through, through, through the court system. Um, like I said, we have the pending one on elevators. Right now, any other code violation um, are in the the period that we're, the comply by period where they have um, some time to comply. And so as soon as we pass those dates without compliance, we'll be swiftly moving to court um, to, to file those and seek the maximum penalties, which are $100 a day. Um, there are some increased penalties for more flagrant violations, which we've, we almost never utilize. We have a difficult time getting the $100 a day ones, but this seems to me to be the type of property that is worthy of that. And so we'll be exploring that as well. Um, I think that's everything I have, unless there's any questions. Thanks, thanks, counselors. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Jake Dishaw, please. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. So what I want to be very clear about is um, Codes has been very active in this uh, apartment building for years. Uh, going back since 2012, we've completed, successfully completed and resolved over uh, 100 cases, uh, 132 to be exact. Um, those are individual cases that have multiple violations on each. Um, all of those resulted in uh, hundreds of violations that have all been uh, since resolved. The only remaining open violations uh, as of this moment are, are from this calendar year, uh, the 2021 calendar year. Uh, so we've been extremely active um, going from the start of the timeline in fall of 18. Uh, we've issued 77 violations since the fall of 2018. Uh, much of the action that you heard from Chief Trudell uh, and, and uh, Kristen Smith from law are results of codes uh, inspectors being out uh, in this building, meeting uh, with these tenants and citing code violations. So uh, Kristen spoke to two of them, but in 2019, you start off with the elevator case uh, that went to court, which is now an issue again that will be going back to court. Um, and then uh, an issue with with the water heaters uh, with the boiler system. Um, all of those are results from codes cases uh, from violations being cited. Um, 2019, we made a uh, had a similar effort to what Chief Trudell was speaking of with joint inspections 
Um, uh, former, uh, sorry, I got some feedback there. Uh, former director of codes, Ken Towsley, scheduled a meeting with the Tenant Association, and a few inspectors were on site meeting with tenants, uh, going through their units proactively, um, meeting with them about issues that they've seen or been having. Uh, that was in summer of 2019. Uh, <clears throat> Moving on uh, into fall of 2020 is when we start to kind of get an increase of issues, uh, things that we're hearing about elevators, uh, maintenance and, and sanitary conditions in the common areas. Um, <clears throat> we received complaints about that. We started uh, sending inspectors periodically checking in, um, but we also had plenty of complaints coming in from tenants, uh, cited a number of violations. Uh, and started working with management uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, November of 2020, I had direct outreach to the manager of the building, uh, alerting him to the, the big ticket issues that we were seeing and the concern that we had uh, with the safety and well uh, well-being of the residents uh, within the building. Um, uh, then it got progressively worse through the fall and into winter and um, not to repeat what Chief, Chief Trudell went through, but uh, I met with Captain Funier and Chief Trudell to discuss security and uh, sanitary issues inside the Skyline apartment on uh, February the 2nd um, and Friday the 5th of February. We made that first surprise joint inspection visit, which resulted in uh, more violations being issued. Um, which are still uh, pending and open right now. Um, we also looped in County Health Department, who I'm, I don't believe is represented in this meeting right now, but a sanitarian uh, employee uh, also had some cases regarding the feces and the urine uh, and needles found uh, in the common areas throughout the building uh, in, in multiple stairwells on multiple floors. Uh, we did a reinspection, uh, codes that is, with County Health uh, the following week. Uh, on the 19th and, and again on the 26th of February. Uh, moving forward into March, uh, we did a visit with Mayor Walsh uh, and inspected the building uh, and the conditions remain very much uh, the same, actually continued to get worse. Um, and, and that's when we finally declared the common areas of the building unfit for occupation. Um, something we take very serious given the size of the building and the number of the tenants uh, living in the building. We do not want to displace tenants. Uh, we've made that very clear. Our position is uh, we, we don't want to displace anybody. That's their home. The number one goal is compliance and to keep them safe and, and inside their dwelling units uh, in, in their home. So uh, we successfully were able to do that, but also declaring the building uh, unfit and stopping any rent assistance payments uh, from county DSS. Uh, since those efforts in the spring, our, our joint uh, inspections remain uh, in effect. Uh, we stop by daily. Uh, we've been going daily, just spot checking um, unannounced. Um, Kristen mentioned the BAA. We've actually had BAA tickets paid and fines paid for, but violations still remain open. So that's why all of our cases from here on out uh, are going directly to the law department who will uh, pursue those in the court of law with, with the Supreme Court. So uh, standing here right now at this moment, we have eight open codes cases uh, with a total of 19 open violations. The unfit declaration stands and will stand until the elevators are not only repaired, uh, but certified by a licensed elevator company, inspection company, and the common areas be maintained in a satisfactory condition. Uh, moving forward, we will also, we have the building cited for their periodic inspection called a certificate of compliance. That is an entire interior and exterior inspection uh, inside every dwelling unit as well. So uh, we're uh, aggressively seeking, uh, you know, the ownership to not only apply and pay for that inspection, uh, but schedule it and, and start to get our team in there in the individual units. But I'll end with uh, our efforts aren't gonna stop until in, until we get a change from ownership and management. And we're, we've made it very clear uh, the changes that are, are needed and that are required. Um, and, and we're not gonna stop until we get a response where, where we can feel like the residents of that building are not only safe, um, but can be proud of a, a place that they live in. Um, and, and we have up, upcoming court dates uh, this month. So 
Um, that's it, Deputy Mayor. Uh, counselors, thank you for your patience and your indulgence. Um, we just want you to hear from uh, Commissioner Michael Collins of Neighborhood and Business Development and Deputy Chief Elton Davis of the Fire Department. And then we'll turn it back over to you, Councilman Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Councilors, uh, so Michael Collins, Commissioner of Neighborhood and Business Development. Uh, to uh, uh, not, not to rehash, but to build upon uh, the, the extensive uh, work that you've you've been hearing about over the last few years related to um, uh, related to all of our efforts there. Uh, when it comes to the tenant uh, uh, outreach uh, in both directions, it's happened a few different ways. Uh, uh, code enforcement certainly is talking with tenants uh, regularly. We also, uh, when we do our uh, stop, uh, the times that we're able to stop by and, and do um, uh, inspections that are unannounced, we talk with uh, with residents then. Uh, but our, our uh, outreach has gone back uh, for the past few years. So my my predecessor uh, and Jake's predecessor, uh, both, as Jake uh, talked about in August of uh, 2019, uh, was doing outreach and uh, getting into more apartments then. We also, uh, throughout uh, this entire period of time, uh, have had regular contact with uh, Sharon Sherman from the Greater Syracuse uh, Tenants Network. Uh, and uh, as she's uh, able to bring uh, issues forward, we've been able to turn those into uh, code complaints and, and uh, inspections. And, and uh, oftentimes, as, as Jacob said, we're, we're able to get resolution on them. Um, you know, our challenge here is that this has gotten significantly worse, uh, especially over the past year. So, uh, so to that end, we've done we've done a few things. We met, um, uh, as Jake said, in, in beginning of February, uh, we did a surprise inspection. Uh, besides walking through all the common spaces, we were talking with the tenants that were in the common spaces at those times, and unfortunately, people that that didn't live there, uh, but were you know they they saw we were official and were giving us some space. Uh, we've talked with um, tenants throughout since then. We've met with the uh, leadership of their tenant association. Uh, in uh, the end of March, uh, uh, Saturday, April 5th, Mayor and I attended uh, a meeting of the entire uh, tenants network and we were, uh, excuse me, of the tenants uh, association and listened to a lot of tenants at that time. Uh, we've also been proactive about trying to connect um, uh, ownership to a seller, uh, to, to a potential buyer that would actually uh, do some good with this property. Uh, Jake and I met uh, with a potential buyer at the end of the summer uh, Deputy Commissioner Jen Tift and I have um, uh, actively pitched uh, this building to other potential developers uh, over the fall and winter, trying to make sure that we are connecting uh, uh, buyers that we know redevelop properties like this and manage them well. Uh, we uh, and Mayor also uh, uh, tried to make a connection for us as well, and ownership would say. Uh, excuse me, uh, management would say, yeah, you know, give us the connection. We want it. We want to do that. And then we would make the connection and we would hear back from the potential buyer. Oh, they say it's already under contract. So, um, you know, there because of the fact that it's private transaction and we don't have any money in that building, there's uh, uh, limited to what we can do. We're not in a position where we can um, uh, where, where we can force that uh, at, at this time. We have since heard from another potential developer that uh, uh, has got a good history that we would like to connect them to. We are told from ownership that they are close to signing on a deal. We'll see that that part we just don't know, but we're doing everything we can to continue to push good developers towards them. And uh, that's that would be it for me for right now. Final Chief Deputy Chief Davis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Not sure. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, from the fire department's uh, standpoint, I think again not to go back and rehash a lot of stuff that was said by by neighborhood and business development, by the codes department and the police department. We've been involved in all of the all of the surprise inspections, uh, going through just to identify some of the some of the issues, the fire related issues that we have at this property. Uh, we compiled some data here over for the for the past few past few years related to this property. And uh, we've probably been we on an average we respond to this property possibly 16 times per month. 
over the last over the last couple of years for a variety of issues, uh, alarm activations, uh, malicious pull stations, gas leaks, the medical assist, things of things of that nature. Uh, currently, we have one violation that is open at the at the premise, and it involves a probably an illegal use of an of an apartment, someone that that's storing uh, gas powered equipment in their apartment. But we've we've got good feedback from the management about trying to rectify that situation. And again, with all the times that we have been responding to this property, I just like to to just stress the again, it's a lot of lot of a uh, lot of responses to the property. I'm just trying to get my get my numbers up here so I can give you an accurate number. Uh, so yeah, just when we're responding to this property, possibly for the last couple of years, in 2018, you know, probably 59% of our runs that were responding to, to the skyline, 59% of them were medical medical related. Uh, 19, again, 59% of those runs were medical related. Uh, for 20, 2020 and 2021, it dropped a little bit to 42 and 41% respectively for the amount of medical runs that were going going to this property. Again, that, that drop was probably due to due to the COVID and us in the fire department trying to reduce our exposure to you know, put us in a put our, our our personnel in in proximity in proximity to those due to this COVID uh COVID pandemic. But we we expect those numbers to to turn around and to be consistent like they were in 18 and 19. And again, the fire department is probably fire department and emergency services are probably the first call that a lot of lot of the lot of our lot of our citizens made for medical help, you know, for medical assistance. So when they have when they're having issues. So I think that's a big a big part of showing our response to there that we're going there for medical assist. Uh, as for as for fire response runs to this to the premise again we've had a variety of uh instances where we where we go there uh elevator issues people trapped in elevators uh, malicious pulled alarms so i'm open for any other questions that you may have and just to add you know the fire chief is wants to push us in a direction so that we're a little more proactive in having our our personnel report a little bit more you know submit uh submit reports about if we see see some of these kind of life safety issues or public safety issues that we can pass along to the other departments and assist with uh, getting this situation cleaned up. But that's all I have for now, Deputy Mayor, if there are any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Joe, that's all yes. of our stuff. Thank you. Th thank you so much for, for that. Um, Counselors, uh, if you have any follow up question to all of this uh, presented, uh, you are free to go, uh, especially to the uh, to the public safety committee members. That's so, Councilor Carney. I just uh, I have questions if you don't mind. Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess my question would probably be more geared toward. Uh, on Councilor Carney, you you coming in uh, not not so good. Your uh, your you connection is now? not. Uh, okay. uh, now? Yeah, better. Oh, uh, I guess the question is more geared towards law. I guess our ability as the council to change the with. Feel not good, uh, counselor. The tickets and the fines that we have. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, it, 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 we can until you start talking. <laughs> okay. So, again, with, with larger properties like this, is there a way for us as a council to change the way that we do our fining and be able to find larger properties more for issues like this? I, I mean, when we write a ticket, a lot of the times I think when it's a smaller fine, uh, it, it sort of shrugged off and brushed off. Is there a way for us to be able to change the, our legislation so that we can find larger properties, a larger sum to make it actually 
hit the owners in the wallet because that's again been from my own personal experience the only way we actually get uh, the attention and, and things addressed so again chris and i don't know if that's something is that something that would hold up in court or would we get you know sued for uh targeting probably you know larger properties is that within our rights as a council to do so councillor it's a good question um i think you know we would need to be able to articulate a rational basis for the you know why there's different fines for different types or sizes of properties i think you point out to something that i think we've all realized which is you know is it really fair that um a single uh tenant occupied home it's the same fine as a 500 unit um, million dollar enterprise probably not and so there probably is a, a rational you know basis for um having some sort of fine scale so we'd be happy to work with the council i know there's been previous discussions around that with around the level of fines for the baa and whether those needed to be increased and so you know i think you make a good point that part of that conversation could be uh is it increasing them across the board or is it increasing them for certain size properties or certain types of violations. There's also fines uh, embedded into our Syracuse Property Conservation Code. Those are the fines that we seek from the court when we take them to Supreme Court or City Court. Um, and so that's another place where we could look at um, tying the the fines to to the size of the the, the structure. Um, my initial instinct, though, is that as long as there's a reasonable basis, but certainly I always have to sort of caveat that that we would need to go back to the books and really do the deep legal research to get to be very careful about that. Yeah, I, I would just say I just especially with this. Group the Green National, their their ownership. This is not their only problem property that, that we have. I mean, I think, you know, this is something that I, I've tried to deal with an address with, with code since I've gotten on because it's been such an issue. And I think the bigger issue is, is that, you know, over the six years, the problems have gotten worse and worse. And now you're seeing it in a lot of their other properties, such as, you know, 600 James. Is there another property that's, you know, constantly been talked about that's mm -hmm. seeing the exact same types of issues because it's uh, owning uh, owners management, just they're derelict in their duties uh, to provide people with you know, safe spaces and, and it's just, it, it's been very frustrating and, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that we're getting together and having this conversation, but I'm just trying to figure out what we as a legislative body are going to be able to do. And I, that would just be one of the first things that came to mind that, <clears throat> that we should be trying to ticket them more, have higher fines for larger properties. Like, to your point, you know, a two-way house is a different animal than, you know, three, four, 500 units. Yep, Councillor, the other thing I would mention um, is that, uh, you know, before Skyline, you know, was on the headlines, uh, you know, over the past month or so, uh, we had been talking internally about how do we best deploy our limited resources in law? You know, there's only so many cases we can bring and there's so many problem properties in the city. And we had already been talking about a strategy that I don't mind saying very publicly here, which is that if we see a pattern of owners that own multiple properties with repeated problems, that we should be focusing our resources all at once on those, because that's another way to have the larger impact that you might have with, with what you mentioned was a bigger fee to use our existing fee structure to say, all right, you've got 10 properties and all 10 of them are in, 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 in bad shape. We're going to, we're going to bring actions against all 10 of them all at once. And that's, um, you know, I can, we, those are conversations we've been having and the plans are in, in, in the works. And then the, this, this case happened, which just further illustrated the need to um, employ that strategy um, moving forward. So Kristen, you're saying that the plans are in the works. So how long is it gonna take you guys to really zero in on the other properties? So we're, we're working with uh, NBD right now. Um, they're, they're an important partner in terms of developing the data and pulling together the data to figure out where that target should be um, in terms of, okay, you know, oftentimes properties are owned under different legal entities and at first blush, they don't seem to be connected. But then when we dig a little deeper with our data, data analysts and MBD, we start to realize that they are connected. Um, and so instead of just sort of like randomly kind of picking the first one that pops up, uh, you know, on our list to, to, to group things together, um, more strategically. And so we're, we're working on, we're, in fact, we had a, a meeting scheduled uh, last week. Um, we've been meeting um, 
at least monthly since January um, with, with this new approach. Uh, it was paused during, you know, this past year when courts really weren't open, but as we were, as courts were opening back up, this was the way we were going to approach things. And counsel, this is Sharon on the legal end, um, Kristen's approach on the physical end, the joint efforts that uh, we have uh, deployed at Skyline, we're doing now on other properties, particularly owned by this um, this group, but we're looking at other large properties as well that we can use that same strategy. Okay, that was gonna be my next question. So thank you, um, Debbie. Councilor Majok, I wonder if I could ask a question. Uh, yeah, Councilor, Councilor Carney, are you all set? Because you said you had. Uh... That's fine. I, I, I'll yield my time and allow some other councilors. Okay, okay. Councilor Hogan, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate our city departments for their action. And, uh, you know, myself and, and, and especially uh, Mr. Dishaw and, and, and Kristen, we've talked about this before, but what I find appalling is the abysmal action of our court system. You uh, continually bring cases and violations to them. And uh, this is not the only property where I've seen this happen, where the, where the um, penalties are, I mean, ridiculous. I mean, this one particularly is, you know, Judge Tormey did, it was passed, uh, passed on, um, excuse me, I got a phone ring in here, but. Uh, who's passed on made a made a, um, uh, you know a, put a fine up of fifty two hundred dollars, but um, it seems like the water the water boiler issue. Whatever, I mean, it seems like you could have it, 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 they the folks didn't have a water a hot water boiler from July to November. Is that it, Kristen or or Jake? Um, I, let me pull that up, but it was months to your point. It was months, right? So they had it's, months to fix that. And the mere fact that they fixed it by the time the court rendered a decision, there was no penalty. So it was a other than $200 in court costs, right? $200 right. in court costs. So, so let me ask you just this. Let me ask you this question because I, I we run into all the time as city council. If you have an entity that continually, uh, runs their buildings uh, to the point where it imperils public health. Certainly this building does. Does it ever elevate to an issue where it might be a criminal, a, a criminal statute would handle, would handle something like that, where somebody continually imperils public health and is aware of it. The police department made them aware, the law department codes made them aware, and now they're doing it in, in, in their other buildings. Does that ever elevate to a criminal? situation there's a provision in our property conservation code that can rise to that level and we're looking at that um and then we're also partnering uh we're, we're taking a look i don't want to get into a lot of detail but i mean we are t t t trying to t take a closer look at those issues with our partners at other levels of government because i fortunately uh have served the city a long time and you know i brought this up before about a decade and a half ago there was a corporation council who put one of our most notorious landlords, who still opera, who still operates properties, into jail for a period of time? Um, so I'm, I, I would think for something like this, this is an appalling issue, and it doesn't seem like we've, uh, it doesn't seem like they're going to reform. So if we could look at that, I, I think that one might be a certainly would be an interesting solution for this. Yeah, and I know you and I have spoken about that. Um repeatedly and yeah it's 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 got to be the right case and you make you make a good point that if there's if there's ever a case is it this one you know but we're, we're definitely looking at closely at that thank you thank you councilman thank you councilor hogan uh any any other counselors when i uh yes councilor Majoka, i have a question if i may yes please a couple one. Uh, I think so this, this one is just kind of a general question. And, you know, as we look uh, at the timeline that was provided to us um, by Deputy Maryland, we see like a, a period of time from at least 2018 all the way up to 21 uh, with plenty of activity um, happening between the codes, fire, law, and SPD. Um, so 
given that amount of activity, I, I just I want to I'm wondering why did it take uh, until the death of a 90 year old uh, white lady until there was more serious actions taken um, to rein in the behavior of these landlords. And uh, further, I also want to know at, at what point uh, did this mayor's office know about it um, so that we can kind of put together why something more serious didn't happen here? So, so, so I'll speak to the nuance of these large, large buildings and, and, and um, the director uh, Dishaw spoke to it. In practice, what we do with nuisance abatement, what we do with um, unfits are usually unfits on units. Um, we'll see a single family, two family house, something much, much smaller. Um, and we'll declare it unfit. And then we will be proactively engaging with our not for profit partners to relocate individuals. Same thing for nuisance abatement and Joe Cecil is the expert at hand on that. And that we will declare um, um, uh, declare it the building a nuisance, and then we will vacate the property. Most recent on top of my head is 127 South Avenue, um, and that was closed for a year. Um, the dilemma with these large, large buildings is to Dick Drake Jake's point. There are two, 300 and some odd units in there, more individuals than that in there because families are in there. And where would we where would we locate so many people? And quite frankly, that's a that's a rock and a hard place we find ourselves in. And I'm 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 not I'm not um, sure that people who own these properties understand we're in that condition, in that position. So the the reality of being able to to move on it in a way that we have practiced before was different in this situation. And, and and that is how uh, council said, well, well, one way we can do this is let's declare the common space unfit. And at least in that situation, we can stop payment to the person. To um, Councilor Hogan's point, sometimes that's the only way you get any, any behavior change from some individuals who are have these large cash cow places. Um, and then we stop the flow of money. Um, so that that in itself is it, it was about the people living in the building and and just us here and they didn't want to want to move that's their home and that's real the realization of where would we relocate so many people um there's also the concern of vacating a building like that that it won't if the if the owners aren't securing it properly with people in it i can only imagine how irresponsible they'd be with a vacant building and then we'd have another level of, of community issue with a vacant building with fire having to attend to a vacant building and in, in, in multiple departments. When did the mayor's office know about the the issues in the building? Um, the departments, every department that's before you, um, except for law and BAA, are under my oversight. So as far as understanding and Sharon Sherman, who communicates with NBD, communicates with, they communicate with me. So when did we know that the building was at this level of deterioration? Probably as we got into the last quarter of 2020. We were dealing with buildings all across the city because of, of the moratorium. We could, people couldn't move. People couldn't be evicted. If they wanted to move, they couldn't find another place to go. Um, tenants who didn't deserve to live next to the tenants who live in this building. Under the moratorium, we were dealing with these moratoriums against evictions all across the city. And so towards the end of last year, the last quarter, I would say, we began to hear about how much the um, problems going in there, particularly when it comes to the crime and the, un the people who were not supposed to be in the building, we became aware of it. That's when we began to gather, have these un um, unscheduled visit uh, inspections, um, communicate with the police department about heightened patrols in the area, um, engagement with the management, the things that you've heard us reported. 
um, I, I feel the need because of that question to say no way, no way, shape or form did this administration in this office and me in particular who oversee these departments ignore that or try or, or, or not take seriously what I was being told about the conditions and what was going on towards the end of not last year. Certainly, Deputy Mayor Owens, and it's, you know, uh, I can understand your concern, but it's not a, I'm not, it's not a personal uh, attack here. Um, but I do want to zero in on something that you, uh, you did mention, uh, you know, uh -huh. you said that, that there weren't really things that you could do, but then you did, but then you have also shown here that there are several things that you could have done, in fact, to actually try and force more compliance out of, out of these landlords, right? Like you, you, you declared the building unfit so that the, the stop of money or stop the flow of money, right? Uh, you had demanded them to, uh, make increased security. Right, you provided a, a police detail um, that, uh -huh. fortunately, they have agreed to pay for. Um, uh -huh. um, and but so, given that those were, those actions were available to you, what was the, the delay in instituting some of those practices? Again, why did it take until somebody died? And, you know, and we're actually only talking about the the old lady that died, but I, I do believe the a week or two before that, there was an overdose death uh, that was reported um, in that same stairway. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, again, we knew it was such a bad building. Why did it take so long? Well, um, I will say that the 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 laws that we have around um, declaring a property code and declaring a building unfit followed a path traditionally that relocated individuals. So I believe we were focused in on not wanting to do that, and it took, you know great folks in Kristen's office to look at how could we actually, you know, peel apart the law to be able to um, use that law in a manner by which we could get the result that we wanted from the, the owner while not displacing the tenants. And that's when we came up with the declaring the common spaces unfit, which let me tell you is something that we plan on doing anytime we need to move forward. Um, the the police um, we we contract um, with other um, the police with other properties around the city for off duty police officers. Um, this building um, it should not be a surprise to anyone. These owners um, clearly don't like spending money on things um, that they need to, and so um, at. And counselor, unfortunate, it is unfortunate. It's tragic that at that point we made the the point that with the nuisance abatement, these are the terms that you have to abide by. You need to pay for our police officers. Um, it is absolutely a shame that the city of Syracuse taxpayers, even though they're paying off duty officers, that the that the the hours and organization that has to go into securing the building that these owners own instead of our officers being able to be outside and maybe being doing other details and other patrols, whether it be dirt bikes or you know, God forbid, knock on wood fireworks coming up. Um, but with the nuisance abatement declaration, that was when we were able to determine make a determination that that would be one of the um, requirements of that nuisance abatement declaration. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. And then I just have one um, more additional question at the moment. Um, so we were, you know, we're talking about that these are problem landlords, right? And we we know that they've got several other buildings. And and at count, I was able to go to their website and pull it up. It looks like they have at least nine other buildings um, spread throughout uh, the city of Syracuse. And I'm wondering. You know, obviously, you know, we have we have landlord problems here and we should obviously address that as it pertains to other landlords. But because the skyline and the greens are on our radar, um, what's being done about, you know, these other properties? Are they are they being are they getting that same level of attention? You know, are we checking them out to make sure that that they're you know fit for habitation, right? That they're not also being a complete drain on our city's resources? To um, my answer to Councillor Allen's point, and I'll um, defer to Jake on this. I think I still see you somewhere. Um, yes, um, we we know that they have, and I, you might be close, you might be off one. Um, they have multiple properties in this um, city 
We've identified all of them and are proactively engaged um, in all of them. We're getting a lot of help from tenants um, in those other buildings, giving us, um, um, letting us know what's going on in those buildings, but we're not relying on that. We are proactively engaging in what's going on in their buildings. Jake, do you want to talk about some of that that you're working on right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it kind of connects to your first question, uh, Councillor White. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the activity that you're seeing from from our department within codes um, are, are things that aren't normally in the media. It, it's not a story. It's not on the news. But if you look up our history, we've got a lot of action. We've got a lot of cases and a lot of resolved cases in, in a lot of these buildings. Um, some of the other addresses and other buildings that you that are, have been brought up. We, We've actively have ongoing cases there prior to all of the unfortunate events and the tragic uh, event that took place at the Skyline apartment. Um, and that's what we do every day and what we'll continue to do. Um, whether it's a news story or on the top headline on Syracuse.com, we're going to continue uh, to make sure that we're keeping our residents safe. And, um, you know, we're going to push cases uh, to the law department if we need to, but our number one goal is compliance and we have achieved that a number of times um, throughout many of these buildings. Um, and, and that's the goal. Uh, again, we don't want to displace anybody. We don't, we take it very serious when we have to declare something unfit for human occupancy. Um, you know, it's, it's not the number one option, but sometimes it, it reaches that point. And, and with the skyline, we reached a point where it progressively got to that. Uh, that condition where it was bad enough for us to make that declaration uh, and, and I was comfortable with moving forward in that fashion. But uh, as the deputy mayor mentioned, we'll continue to do that if we need to in other buildings um, and pursuing all avenues possible. But I, I don't want it to seem like none of these buildings have, like we don't have a presence in any of these other buildings. We do. Um, you can look it up, um, you know, prior to any of this taking place. So, um, you know, we'll continue to do that, but I, I think it's a bit unfair to say, why are we responding now? Um, you know, that that's not, that's not accurate. Um, we have had a presence, um, as Kristen mentioned earlier, we've gone to court numerous times on some other cases, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. So, um, unless there's any other questions, I'll turn it back over to you. Are you all set, Councilor White? Uh, yes, I'm all set at this time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other counselors? Yeah, Councilor. Yeah. Just one. Yes. yes, please, Council Green. Uh, so, I mean, I appreciate uh, Jake's comments right there. And I, I think when you go through the timeline, what you're really seeing here is, um, you know, when we're proactively doing things like we are right now, things are getting better. And when we're reactive, things got worse. I mean, even if you go back over the two years, the time period where we spent, spent a lot of time in the building and calls went down and then it kind of fell off our radar and things kind of got worse again. So I guess the biggest thing I'm most concerned about is making sure that we have a structure in place. You know, once every, all the attention's moved on that we still have the same level of attention on these buildings and other buildings to make sure that we're proactively addressing these issues. And so what is kind of like there, is there a, a focus group that's going to be working on this going forward or what's kind of the action item that'll make sure this effort sustained going forward? Thank you. Thank you for that, Councilor Green, because that is important. Um, with everything, um, what do we learn out of something? And what we learn out of this is um, the code enforcement is in nature reactive because when we hear it, then we respond to it. But what we know now is for these large buildings, there has to be some type of proactive, ongoing, strategic method methodology by which we um, take a look at the buildings, we see what's going on in there, and then we follow our enforcement. So that is what's behind the high occupancy uh, monitoring and enforcement unit. And that unit is comprised of the people who are here with us today. Um, specific individuals identified. It is on um, um, my responsibility is to oversee the effectiveness and the operations of that unit. The purpose for that unit is to look at those really big buildings. We all know where they are. They're on every quadrant of this city. And to be able to proactively um, go into the buildings, look through the buildings, interact, particularly with our NBD and their community partners, with tenants in the building, 
advocates, social advocates in the buildings to make sure that um, we hear from tenants while we're also looking at the physical um, aspects of the building and working with law again to ensure that we're using every avenue. What um, this particular thing uh, uh, situation did was stretched our muscles to look at what within our existing law. Councilor Carney asked the question. Um, the fines we have on the books do nothing as incentive for very large buildings with multiple units in it. Um, and so our plan is moving forward, um, doing that. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading Councilor Allen's mind. When is that going to happen? This month, I'm, I'm convening that group, get a schedule together when we're going to be going into these buildings to strategically look at data driving some of the calls we're getting, but not waiting for the calls, particularly for the larger buildings, the very large buildings. I don't know if I answered your question, Councilor. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Majo, um, can I go next? Please. Okay. Uh, for this particular one, do we know if there's a um, property management team um, on site during regular business hours? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Jake is Jake and uh, Rich are the ones who interact with them more than me. Okay. And then um, legally, Kristen, do you know if there's Legally, can we require for like large apartment buildings such as these to have like 24 hour property management on site? Uh, I guess I'll start with the first question. Uh, there, there is uh, a manager on site, uh, but it's more business hours during the day. Um, you know, there's a couple of staff that are on site. Um, and a number of maintenance workers. I don't have an exact number, but um, there is an office and a couple of uh, full time uh, employees that work within that office, including uh, one of the senior managers who not only manages Skyline, but a few of the other uh, buildings owned by Green National uh, in the James Street corridor. But um, he's on site daily uh, as a full time job. And if I can just add to that, there is a there is some sort of property manager on site 24 7. We've got an apartment there. And on several occasions, we have reached out when they're after hours um, and had that individual help help us and assist us. On the legal side, we've actually been researching that, uh, Counselor. Um, our team has been looking at um, what our options are in terms of potential, you know, perhaps a new ordinance requiring some level of security for buildings of a certain size. Um, looking at what other cities do um, along those lines and, you know, trying to figure out um, if there's a proposal that could be advanced, you know, you know, units, buildings with X number of units need to have this type of security in place. Um, that doesn't exist right now. Um, we think it is something that could be put into place. And so we're already looking at it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? So I have one myself, uh, Kristen. Um, so, you know, we have spoken about the responsibility of, of, of the government toward the building. Um, yet we haven't touched and then I'm, I'm, I'm asking this to, uh, for you, Kristen, yet we haven't talked about accountability toward organization that keeps sending these checks and, and to also see how they keep sending these checks knowing that the, the, the building is, is, is as deplorable as it is. Is, is there a way we we can hold this organization accountable in some way? Because for me, I, I, you know, I, I'm looking, and the, legally may not, Kristen, may, may not, I don't know, but I'm asking, uh, and I have stated it before, early before this meeting, that somehow we go after the government to, to try to fix everything. Yet at the same time, we ignore individual responsibilities and this organization that keeps sending in checks are supposed to be eyes and ears of, of, of this vulnerable population, yet they keep sending the checks. Don't they check? And this, this also goes if, the, if any of these organizations that have those community members in that building, 
are here, I would like to hear their perspective as well. They keep right. sending checks, knowing that the building is unfit, yet you keep sending in this check and you don't go in to check where these people are, are living and how they are living, yet you keep financing that that that, that spot. I I I I just I I I would like any of that organization and if if Kristen or any other department heads are aware of what organization be, beside Anadaga County and Helio Health that have people that are that, that live there. Um if any if anyone can 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 tell us in more details what organization out there, one. Uh second is is what 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 action have they taken knowing that this building has been unfit for, for a very long time? I can answer that, Councilman Majo. Sure. Uh, my name is Derek English. I'm the director of our care uh, management services here at ACR Health. Uh, we do provide subsidy checks for people who do live in that building. Uh, we do inspections concurrent with the uh, HUD guidelines. Unfortunately, we are looking out for our clients first. If we stop paying the rent for them, they will be evicted. This is not an agency problem. This is a citywide problem. There is not enough affordable housing here. It is not ACR's job to go in and do the city's job and the code's jobs. Prior to working here, I was an attorney at Hiscock Legal Aid. I did evictions. Um, so dating back to 2011, when I started doing evictions, my clients from the skyline would come in with codes violations. This problem has been going on a lot longer than 2018. The city and codes have been aware for a lot longer than this. Uh, the, the problem is, is we do not have enough affordable housing in this city, period. We don't have anywhere close to enough affordable housing in this city. We are missing the point here. This is more than just one big landlord not doing a good job. You can walk around this city and look with your own eyes and see the problems here. So to single out agencies for providing rent checks, uh, that's not where the problem is. We are here to protect and serve our clients. Um, when we stop paying the rent, that rent just doesn't go away. The, the tenants then become responsible for 100% of that rent. So now that the city has stopped paying rent, that responsibility is gonna fall onto the clients. It's gonna fall onto the tenants. I understand the logic behind it and something does need to be done and I applaud the city for stepping up and taking these actions. But I'm a client-centered agency and I serve my clients and this is not helping them and our people. We are right now working on getting a list of landlords together who we're not gonna rent to anymore and we're not gonna send clients to anymore. And that list is gonna be a lot longer than the suitable landlord list in this county. And it's a shame really. Um, we have done everything in accordance with the law and we struggle with this on a daily basis. I, I don't believe it's fair to single out Helio Health or ACR Health or even the city could be, uh, for continuing to pay the rent. The problem is, is this problem has been there for at least 10 years and it's being addressed now. Councilman White brought up a good point. Why did it take this for you know, a murder of someone for really the city agencies to step up. Why, why only in 2018 did this happen? And Mr. English, Mr. English, I am not blaming anybody. I'm, I'm simply asking a question, a question that, that does not exempt anyone from their responsibilities. Now, here's my question. I, as, as a city official, accept my responsibility. But what I'm trying to say here, for the sake of everyone here, is the fact that Helio Health, and I'm not singling you out, you are single health, uh, uh, Helio Health plus other organizations that are responsible and pay rent for their client in that building. I'm asking a simple question, and that and that the question I'm asking. Is, is, is it's putting into consideration that we have issues with housing here, yes. But that does not exempt us from asking and making the right advocacy. And my question simply has been, if the condition of the building is in a such, why do we keep con continue to send rent knowing the condition of the building, one? Number two, we, we what have been the responsibilities and action that you have taken as community organization to make noise, to make to, to, to advocate for your community members, to advocate for your client, beside what we do as a government? That's what I'm asking. And, and, and more than anything, it's more rhetorical and, and, and as well as it is a question. So I'm not blaming anyone here. I'm not, I'm just asking a simple question. And, and as a city, as a city, we can do as much as we can. 
as 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 cold as you can see here, code has been doing what as much as they can. But as community organization, as people that are responsible for these people's lives, paying for their rent, you have a right to also inquire about the living condition of, of these people. And and, 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 and and for me saying that, I'm saying that it's a shared responsibility here. And, 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 and as organization that keep paying these rent and making and, and saying nothing, I have a problem with that. Um I'd like to jump in if I can. Council, Council Major, could I, could I, sorry, who is that? Could I, oh. could I say something real Council quick? I would just like to say, but to, to uh, I your English's points tremendously. Um, I appreciate Council Major's points. Um, one thing that I think we've left completely out of the conversation in the press in all these conversations is that the bulk of this is federal money, and nobody ever expects our federal representatives to get involved in this conversation. While Helio Health does not have the ability to stop cutting checks, the federal government and HUD do. They do have and they do have the power to hold these places accountable. And parts and and Skyline is not the only horrible place with feces and urine in the halls in Syracuse. I have Parkside Commons in my district. You can go on any day of the week and find baggies and urine and uh, feces on the floor. And, and, and so um, I'm really distraught that as we look at, at different agencies to blame for this, uh, the federal representatives never have come into the conversation in any of this skyline conversation or any of these. And as far as concerned, they're the primary agency that has the leverage, that has the money, that provides the federal uh, subsidies that go into these buildings, that does have the level of clout and pull that could create some real consequences for these buildings. So uh, I don't think it's on Helio or ACR or uh, any of these, I think that we should, you know, there's, it's every, right, it's everybody's responsibility, right? We're all, we all play a part in this. We all, we all have a role to play. But the fact that the federal has not been mentioned in this, when the bulk of this is federal money, I think is, uh, we're, we're, we're missing a big part of the picture, in my opinion, as I just want to comment on that. Thank, thank you, good. Councilor Driscoll. Uh, do I hear some, some other counselors want to make a comment? <laughs> If not, Councillor, I'd like to say something. There will be a time for that, uh, Ms. Chairman. Uh, give me a second. Councillor Majok, when, when, when you're ready from MBD, I, I can also add some context for you as well. Please, go ahead. So so you, you bring up, and, and, and Mr. English uh, brings up some, uh, one of the things that I think is really important to consider right here, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of understandable anger around the entire situation. And uh, the question of well, what, why did it, why did it take this for something to happen? And what I think many people have been able to hear throughout this uh, is that there has been an escalation all along on the work that has happened, but it is not in the paper, so that's not seen. What is not, what makes this exceptionally challenging is that this is an entire systems issue. And so, to Councilor Driscoll's point and to Mr. English's point. We have been significantly underfunded for years from the federal federal government in our ability to create additional new housing that is for income qualified individuals. When you put on top of that, that we are dealing with predatory ownership that has increased its ability to be not not ability, but um, their desire and their activity in a predatory nature. As much as we have worked towards, uh, we, we have continued all along to change what we do. They have continued to work all along to find ways around that. So we are dealing now with a worse issue within the building and a, um, you know, what, what, one of the things that really hasn't been talked about here is the effect of COVID over the past year. So the housing market over the past year has gotten significantly more expensive. And therefore, what that means is there's even fewer options. So for the people that do want to relocate out of here, whether it's because of the individual or the agency, there's fewer options. From the city side, we asked back in February that, how, that the housing agencies that we deal with uh, that um, uh, uh, stop putting uh, anybody in there. That was, that was 
long before anything hit the news. Uh, so, uh, and we've been having conversations with these agencies around what can we do going forward? And they're very open to them. That doesn't mean this problem doesn't exist right now. And it doesn't mean that not that there's not responsibility, but to, but there is responsibility everywhere. And, and you, you, you are right. And I, I, I understand everyone's point of view. And, and what I'm, what I'm trying to say is to also echo what everybody is saying that this is a shared responsibility and, and. Where, where I pump breaks a little bit is when everybody look. Look to the city to solve everybody's problem. That's it will take everyone to solve this issue. And everyone taking their responsibility city can cannot do it alone. If a city goes in with a code issue ticket and try to hold the landlord accountable as well as community organization that keep cutting the checks need to also look after these people need to also look after the lives of, of the people they keep keep cutting these checks for that's what i'm trying to say and i think it, it's important that 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 the way we, we these organizations keep looking after these people is to keep making the report so that when we have a conversation like this, we will, we will know where to go to. We will know exactly who did what and what who didn't do what. And at this point, every everyone right now is pointing their hand to the city as, as we supposed to do something alone. Yes, I, I, I as, as a city official, I have a responsibility. And it was a mistake that there are mistakes here. There are mistakes, but these mistakes cannot only be put on city alone. Every organization need to take their part as we are all responsible. Now, with that being said, I would like to. Councilman Joe, uh, this is Councilor Bay. Um, I, I've been listening to the discussion and I, I'll state what we already know, but I think it's necessary to, uh, to state as much. Um, <clears throat> at the risk of sounding um, like, like I'm accusing, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this in the short, and this has been, this has been implied in some respects. In the short, we have to own when the ball has been dropped period. There's been a lot of, uh, passing the buck with all due respect in this conversation. I'll mention the fact that I've called calls before. And I sit on the council, uh, and I won't say when, cause I'm not singling out any individual, but I called calls before about a, a particular house with squirrels in the wall. Now this was maybe a year and a half or so ago, maybe just prior to COVID, the squirrels are still in the wall. So, so <clears throat> whether you're talking about this building or this one two family house that now also have raccoons and skunks occupying the place as well, we dropped the ball. We have to be more responsive, and, and and that's why I said, forgive me early on. I'm saying what we already know, but we can't escape the fact that we dropped the ball. Because I'm speaking on one one situation, one of many that I know about, where I call code enforcement, and the person still hasn't gotten the remedy yet, and the landlord is still collecting rent. We just got to own it and fix the problem. That's all I got, Councilor. Agreed. Um, any other counselors before we move on? So at this time, I would like to 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 invite any community representative, community organization that that want to make a statement or or just share a testimony. And each one will have two minutes. Um, Jim, is is there a way we could we could keep track of who's who want to speak? Uh, Councilor Majo, Jim had to take off. He left his machine running though because he's recording. Uh, okay. If anyone wants to speak, okay. they could send a message uh, to me in the chat box, and then I can unmute them when their turn is. You know, when it's their turn. Okay. Okay. Or I know uh, Miss uh, Sherman, uh, Sharon Sherman, want want to speak. Uh, let's let's give it to you. Sharon. Please state state which organization you represent. Or if you are are, are, are at, attending or okay, or I'm Sharon Sherman, Executive Director of the Greater Syracuse Tenants Network. 
I first want to acknowledge that two of the members of the Skyline Tenant Association Board, Larry Fuller and Anne Marie Machene, have both been on the call. Um, I don't believe they want to speak. Um, I want to talk about a little bit our perspective uh, representing the Tenants Association, which started in May 2019. And um, I think uh, everything that's been said about the difficulties of this particular corporate owner, this is clearly, I've been doing this for 30 years, one of the most difficult owners to ever deal with because um, they give you a ton of answers and don't follow through and I question their competency. I will agree with the city, however, that um, our last tenant meeting was February 2019. We were not able to hold our 20 March 2019 meeting and have since not really met except for an outdoor meeting on April 3rd. However, the board has met and it was, there was a, a, a low for COVID in terms of the complaints I was hearing, both about the security and the conditions. So I think that accounts to some extent why with other priorities and we did work like getting masks to the building and stuff like that. So from my perspective, again, December 2020, January, February 2021, escalation. And I know it seems and some tenants have repeated what Councillor White said to me, said that it had to be for a white lady to be murdered. But I think in this case, um, when they did that February uh, surprise inspection, that was a result of the complaints they were getting. And I think, you know, I'm, you know, that again, the pressure was moving and things were moving at a very heavy pace. However, this is the first time, and I applaud the administration for marrying nuisance abatement and stronger action in the court. We do not have enough tools. Uh, one thing, uh, Councilor Driscoll, is that this building is not primarily funded by HUD. Many, many of these tenants actually um, are private pay. And there are systemic problems with the issues of why agencies place people in this building. I think Marnie Eisenstadt did a, a try in her article of explaining the issues about the Housing First program and what the government will pay. And there's probably a role in the federal government to say you can't just put people in a building and not give the agencies putting them there substantial funds to do the kind of case management that these people need to stay in the building. So it's a it is such a complicated situation at this building. And um, we, and the thing that I am surprised the police did not mention is that this is not over. Um, the amount of police they've cut back, the building has hired private security and in the first week of operation has been an absolute disaster. And, Karen, yep. Karen, your time is up. Okay. Well, you. I you'd like to hear from the people, but you know, I feel like there's more the, to say on behalf of the tenants. But she, she, two, it was two minutes, Sharon. That, that, okay. Yeah. Any 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 other? Yeah, Councillor uh, Megan Stewart would like to speak next. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, Megan Stewart, Director of the Housing and Homeless Coalition of Central New York. Uh, we represent uh, roughly 30 nonprofits in the area, including um, the Continuum of Care funded HUD programs. That is a subsidy uh, program for people who are formerly homeless that I think have been mentioned today. So I just wanna give some background on how these um, projects function and what the oversight and ability of these projects is. Um, so when these agencies are placing people into apartments, including places like Skyline, there's an initial inspection and inspection annually after that. 
Uh, in the meantime, case management is provided. Obviously, the pandemic has limited what case management can look like, not just through our funded programs, but also through the mental health system, um, which I think has had some effect on this. But I just want to say that though these projects do have some funding to do minor repairs in an apartment, they're not able to withhold rent until the building has been deemed unfit or move clients out. They're under leases and under the same protections uh, as tenants are, and they don't have any other rights, even if people are placed there by organization. So I just wanted to address that issue that um, they're not able to break leases and leave just the way tenants aren't. Um, so until that unfit goes through, funds can't get withheld. So they can be stuck as much as a, a, a tenant without agency representation can be. And I just wanna echo Sharon's uh, comments that this is systemic. Um, the reason there's so many people with subsidies or with agencies in, in, proj or in housing buildings that are so concentrated is because there's nowhere else to go. Um, I think the city shoulders the burden of a lot of uh, the affordable housing. Once you move outside the city, there are very limited options. All of these projects have to fall within uh, rent guidelines that they're not able to go over and reasonability guidelines that cuts the market for agencies looking for properties down a quarter at least. Um, so I, I I, as the Housing and Homeless Coalition, we've been working with the city behind the scenes. Um, we're Megan? not gonna, yep, my two um, minutes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, anybody else? No, hearing not, no one um, that will come back, circling back to, to our discussion with, uh, with the, uh, Police and and the other department. Now, I, I you know I, this question goes to Chief Buckner and and Sharon Owen and hopefully Kristen. Moving forward, is could you just oh, do an overview of any proactive plans that are in place beside, beside our usual code visit and stuff like that? What, what, what would be some of the, 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 the proactive action that, that are going to be regular and, and, and recurrence and stuff like that? So to um, um, Councilor Green's question before about uh, moving forward, um, proactively um, engaging this uh, home unit for the continued um, proactive inspections of these large, large buildings. It is the large, large buildings that, um, to Sharon Sherman's point, we just lack the appropriate tools to be able to address the issues on this large scale. Not just this building, but multiply. He has 10 and then add the, the, the others that Joe Driscoll mentioned and those of us around this table who know these buildings are all over. Um, and not all of them are horrible, but all of them have their own distinct um, proactive needs from us to be able to look into their operations, the health and wellness of the people living there and the safety of them. And so going forward, that is our what we're going to do. I'm not even gonna use the word our plan. That is what we're going to do to focus in on these large buildings. Now. The, the question is, that number is huge. And Jake probably has five people in his staff, inspectors. So um, part of it is the capacity. And, and, and to the point that was made before, I'm not trying to pass the book. I'm speaking fact. Um, we're, our, our law department is dealing with corporations who have uh, lawyers that they can pull in from all over the place to combat every single thing we throw at them. But that doesn't mean we're going to stop throwing it at them. You do not have the right to create a living situation where people cannot be safe and healthy in. What we've learned through this, and that is uh, anytime I learned something that I didn't know, I say it. And what we've learned through this, if, if, if we were behind the eight ball when it came to large units, large buildings. So we have to get another game plan together for them. 
And that's what we're proactively doing right now, counselor. Okay. Now, I'm I, sorry, I, 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 I get people call it passion, I guess. I don't know. No, no, I, uh, Deputy Mayor, I share, I, I share what you are feeling because I think, I think, you know, as people that are tasked to look after people, it's our job to make sure that they are safe and, and to, for, for life to slip away like this is, is painful. It is painful. Counselor, can I, can I also just answer uh, JB for a minute? JB, sure. you're right. When we look at affordable housing, we, we have our agencies that do low income housing tax credits. We have um, very low subsidy. I mean, subsidized buildings for very, very low income. Um, you mentioned more, and Sharon has mentioned that many of the um, individuals in the skyline are private pay. They pay their own rent. Nobody helps them pay it. What is missing under all of our all of our funding, the public funding opportunities that we have, is that it's always confined to certain incomes. And just because you're not considered HUD. Um, low mod income doesn't mean that you're still not working two and three jobs to pay your rent. And so what we're hoping and housing is a focus of this administration as we begin to look at how to use the stimulus money. How we can be able to provide support to individuals who do not fit into those nicely carved out governmental income boxes. I'm done. Thank you. Any other counselors want to add anything? Yeah. Councilman Judge, I have a question. So, sure. I, you know, as we keep hearing that there are, you know, issues with affordable housing, you know, here in Syracuse, I think that's been brought up by a number of people that that there just is extreme lack, and that's definitely a truism. Um, I'm wondering, you know, has the administration thought about conducting a housing study um, to figure out what level uh, we're at so that we can declare a housing emergency and enact the protections in the Emergency Tenant Protection Act? Um, you know, everybody gets a little iffy when you start talking about this act because the first thing they think about is rent control. Um, but one of the major benefits of that act is that not only uh, can it help control uh, prices to um, identify, um, you know, the shortages of housing, but it also can um, provide quality standards that these landlords uh, will have to um, maintain, right? So I, I think that's another uh, tool that could definitely be used. Um, to help address the situation, a in both controlling prices and providing you know more affordable housing, but then also making sure that the affordable housing that is provided um, is quality housing um, that these residents deserve to live in. I'm, I'm going to let um, uh, Commissioner Collins speak to the housing plan because yes, we have been discussing the need for a housing plan. Um, what I what I will say is that anytime we receive public funds whether it be federal, state, which is the majority of what we get, it always comes with regulations and stipulations to it that require, one, that it helps create an affordability um, place for individuals. It also hurts people who are just over that affordability threshold. But the other thing it, it, it requires is housing standards with the building and the maintaining once that public money goes in. That is the huge anomaly here with green properties and particularly Skyline. Skyline does not have any of those public dollars in it. Um, Commissioner? Yeah, uh, thank you, Deputy. And uh, Councilor, to, to your point, uh, so we, we've we been um, uh, have, talking in broad outlines about a housing plan for several months. The uh, we, We've had two challenges. Uh, the, and the, the, most, uh, the most obvious is, to well, to us internally, is that uh, the housing market has changed drastically throughout the last 13 months. And so us, us studying at the moment does not necessarily indicate to us that what we would know, that, that what we would learn from it would be useful information 12 months from now, much less for the several years that you would plan, uh, use it to plan for. So we're trying to find the right timing on it. The other issue that we've got is typically within those types of situations, you're dealing with uh, uh, metropolitan areas that have a lack of housing. We don't, we actually have a, a, an oversupply of housing. Uh, the challenge is that so much of it is uh, below market value and would require more money to bring it up to standard. So it's a, then, then the property would be worth on the back end. So it's a, so it's an investor challenge as well. 
and we're really interested in what uh, was possible with the uh, uh, American Rescue Plan dollars to be able to help address, uh, you know, the problems of, of what, you know, what can we do when it comes to creating more affordable housing? So we've, we've been planning for it. We are, uh, we still do not have guidance from uh, the federal government, but we'll soon on, uh, on what we can do with that. And we're looking forward to it. I'll, I'll, I'll just add real quickly that, um, and, and Council Allen is well aware of this, that when we received one of the rounds of the, not one of them, both rounds of the COVID CB um, related um, CDBG funding, um, we were slow at the gate and even getting that money out because of the regulations tied to it. So we just need revenue funding that doesn't come with some of the stipulations that prevent us from, from stepping out of the box for individuals on either side of the affordability scale. But really um, what Sharon says is just driving real home. There are individuals who are not getting DSS, are not getting any kind of Section 8, who are working, and I'm preaching to the choir here, to pay rent, but they don't qualify for any of that stuff. And so they may find themselves having to live in a, in a, in a unit that is affordable, um, but not quality. And so that's the fight that we have to make. And Mike is absolutely right. It's not the, the dirt of buildings in the city, it's quality, safe, affordable housing. Anybody else, counselors? Since we have no one else uh, from the council side, uh, from the uh, department side, this meeting is is come to conclusion and I want to thank everyone that took their time out to come and share their thoughts and listen here. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of, uh, uh, of your after have a great afternoon and we'll see you soon. Thank you, counselor. Thank you. Counselor.